we can find who can provide us with the required knowledge because the second way in which we can acquire that knowledge is by obtaining it from somebody else. Humans have evolved, and this is biologically primary knowledge, humans have evolved over countless generations to share information with each other. In a very real sense, we've become a dominant species because of our ability to share information. Other species can't do it except to a very minor extent compared to us. We are superb at it. The, the, the sort of activity where you and I are engaging in right now is an example of that. We have evolved to do that. So the best way of acquiring novel information is by getting it from somebody else. And that means a teacher. That's what teachers ought to be doing, providing their students with information that their students would have immense difficulty and would probably find impossible to acquire by engaging in problem solving. However you, whatever way you use to acquire knowledge, once you acquire it, it needs to be processed. Okay? You're, you're acquiring knowledge either through problem solving, slowly and, difficulty, and with difficulty, or from somebody else. You now have to process it, do something with it. And that's done within a structure called working memory. And that's really where cognitive load theory comes from because working memory, when it's dealing with novel information, and only when it's dealing with novel information, I'll talk about how it deals with familiar information in a few seconds. When it's dealing with novel information, working memory has extreme limitations. We can only deal with probably two to three uh, elements of information at any given time. Anything more than that and our working memory collapses. We just can't deal with it anymore. That's for novel information. We can hold it in working memory for no more than about 20 seconds. After that, it goes unless we rehearse it. We can then decide, okay, this information might be useful to me later on. I'm going to store it in long-term memory. And long-term memory, unlike working memory, if it has any limits in quantity or capacity, or if it has any limits in time, temporal limits, we don't know where they are. It's enormous. It's infinite. For anything that's of use to us, yes, it, it, it's effectively limitless. It's, it, it's infinite. It's, uh, it is absolutely massive, and we tend to not be aware of how much knowledge is held in long-term memory because normally we're unconscious of it. The only bits we're conscious of are the bits that we then bring back into working memory. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, we, we know lots and lots of things. If you're not thinking about them now, you don't even realise you know them. It's uh, just when you retrieve the file. Yeah, you and retrieve then you go. the file. Yeah, and that leads us to the last aspect of human cognitive architecture that I want to talk about, and that is, I talked about the extreme limitations of working memory when dealing with novel information. When working memory is dealing with uh, familial information that has been stored in long-term memory, there are no known limits. Working memory can, the, the, the limits of working memory that uh, apply to novel information do not apply to familial information. Familial information? Familiar. 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 Familiar, yes. Familiar Fam information. information. Uh, so things we've learned, in other things words. Things we've learned, exactly. Things Explicitly learned. learned or picked up somewhere, somehow, or doesn't combo, matter. doesn't matter how doesn't it got matter. in there. Yeah, once it's in long term memory, uh, we are transformed. Uh, uh, I, I, I say to anyone who wishes to, to listen that 
uh, we all know that education is transformational. We now know why. And why? And why is because of that enormous store of knowledge, of information in long-term memory. That is, that is the thing that changes. And that means the purpose of education, get lots and lots of information into long-term memory. And people keep, when I, when I talk about memory and lots of information, people say, oh, look, that's, that's just a whole lot of isolated facts. That's not the way we operate. It's, it is isolated facts, but it's also large schemes of information. And it's the same with everything you learn at school. Once you've got information in long-term memory, that information can be used in a way and it can allow you to do things which you couldn't dream of doing without it. And the reason you can do it is because of knowledge held in long-term memory. It's not because somebody has taught you how to think. So tell me, how do you define learning? Learning, learning is uh, defined as the uh, transfer of information into long-term memory. If nothing has been transferred to long-term memory, nothing has been learned. That's confronting. Yes, yes. That's confronting. Yes, people find it confronting. But yes. uh, uh, all learning requires something to change in long-term memory. Somewhere along the line, memorising uh, became a negative word in education. Yet it's the definition of learning. And it's the definition of learning. And without memorising, nothing, ha nothing happens. Nothing happens. There simply is... There's, there's no... There is no conceivable definition of learning that doesn't involve storing information in long-term memory. I gave that example of uh, the uh, uh, spilling, uh, the waiter spilling soup on somebody's lap. Uh, it required an enormous amount of information stored in long-term memory for you to be able to understand that. So I'm really going to take that on board. Learning is a change in long-term memory. It's a big concept. Now, I'd like you to explain to me, thinking again about our education leaders and our education system leaders, what would you like them to understand about the implications for the education system and for schools of that idea that learning is a change in long-term memory? The main thing they uh, need to do is either a, obtain an understanding of human cognitive architecture themselves or at the very least hire people who understand that human cognitive architecture and most emphatically hire at least some of those people, they don't have to hire everybody, but to hire at least some of those people into faculties and schools of education because Education ultimately is about learning and you would expect that most people in the uh, Faculty of Education uh, has a reasonable understanding of human cognitive architecture. Unfortunately, that is not the case. 